We're reminded again of the five steps for hypothesis testing. In step one, we're going to state the null and alternative hypothesis and also identify the claim. In step two, we're going to determine the level of significance, which is known as alpha. We're going to draw the picture and determine the critical values. Step three, we're going to compute the test statistic, and at the same time, we're going to compute the p-value. We're going to compare the test statistic value with the critical value in step four, or we're going to use an alternative method. We're going to compare the p-value to alpha. In step five, we're going to make a concluding statement by rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis and make a concluding statement about the problem at hand. We're also going to support the claim. In this particular session, we're going to compute the test statistic and compute the p-value. In step three, we're going to compute the test statistic. As you see here, here are what we term as the test statistics. We have already seen these formulas before when we were working with confidence interval. As we can see, we have three test statistics that we're going to be relating in this topic. As you can see, all require pieces to solve for T or Z. In the first case, we have a population proportion. And in step three, when we have a population proportion, we will use P hat, which is our proportion related to our sample, P, which is our proportion associated with our population, and of course, Q, which is one minus P, as we discussed before, over in the sample size. When dealing with a known standard deviation, we're going to use this formula, where z is equal to x bar, which is our sample mean, minus our population mean, over our given sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. When we have a small sample, or when sigma is unknown, we're going to use this, the t distribution, and again, we will look at X bar, which is our sample mean, mu, which is our population mean or our hypothesized mean, uh, divided by S, which is our sample standard deviation over the square root of N. So as you can see, we will use each of these test statistics. When we're dealing with a population proportion and N times P is greater than or equal to 5 and N times Q is greater than or equal to 5, we can use the Z test statistics associated with the test of a proportion. Whereas we use the mean, we're going to use the T distribution when sigma is not known and the population is normally distributed, or sigma is not known and n is greater than 30. Because we note that if n is greater than 30, the population takes on a normal distribution. Therefore, we're going to use the t distribution, or we're going to look at for t values, where we have x bar minus the mean over the standard deviation of the sample over the square root of the sample size. Finally, when we, have, when we know what sigma is and we have a normal distribution, or when sigma is known and n is greater than 30, then we're going to use the regular z distribution that we can look up on the tables, and we have x bar minus the mean over the population standard deviation over the square root of n. There's another hypothesis test that we can do about the variance or the standard deviation. And in this case, we're going to leave this one out. On the other side of the coin, we have to be able to compute the p-value. Do not confuse the p-value with a probability that is given or with p, the population proportion. The p-value is the area under the curve where the area is to the outside of the bounds established. For example, if we compute our test statistic and we plot our test statistic in our right hand or upper tail test, our p-value is the value under the curve to the right of our test statistic value. If we have a lower tail or a left tail, the p-value is the area to the left or to the outside of our negative test statistic value. Well, what happens if we have a two-tail test? Well, with a two-tail test, now our p-value is on both sides. For example, 
when I compute the test statistic and I find that the test statistic is 2.07. I'm going to go down, I'm going to plot the test statistic 2.07 on my graph, then I'm going to look up 2.07 on my table, and if I read down the 2.0 and read across the 0.07, I'm going to get 0 0.9808. Well, that gives me the area that's unshaded. If I subtract from 1, 0 0.9808, I'm going to get 0 0.0192, which in this case represents my p-value. And again, the p-value is an area under the curve, which means that the p-value can never be zero. Looking at my lower tail or my left tail, let's say that my computed test statistic value is negative 2.07. With a negative 2.07, I'm going to plot that here as my test statistic. And then when I look up the negative 2.07, I'm going to roll down to negative 2.0 and across the 0.07, and I get 0 0.192. Therefore, when I have a lower tail test, I can get my p-value directly from the table. Again, if I have a lower tail test, I can get my p-value directly from the table. So in this case, the p-value is 0 0.0192. In my third case, I have a two-tail test, and where my p-value or my z-value comes out to be plus or minus 2.07. Well, in this case, all I have to do is look up the negative value, negative 2.0 and 7, and I get 0 0.92. I know that both of these are the same because of symmetry associated with the normal distribution. If I have half of it over here, half of it over, over here, how do I get my p-value? Well, I add them together, take it and multiply it times 2. And so in this case, my p-value is 0 0.0384. We've shown you the formulas for computing the test statistic values, and we've shown you how to compute the p-value.